Not only is Tom Hartman a nationally and internationally known progressive talk show host, um, he's a New York Times best-selling author of many books and a four-time recipient of the Project Censored Award, Project Censored being a watchdog organization that educates about the importance of a truly free press for a democracy. And in spite of the awards and the bestsellers, uh, we may most appreciate Tom Hartman um, as an example every day of bringing people from all walks of life together for civil discourse. He does this every weekday for a three-hour talk show every, every day. Um, as you probably know, Tom Hartman has the ability to speak eloquently about many topics, and tonight he will speak about an issue that is near and dear to many of our hearts. It's on the hidden history of guns and the Second Amendment. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Tom Hartman to Seattle. Thanks to KBCS and Elliot Bay Brooks and all the people who really worked so hard to make all this possible, um, and to you in particular for showing up. It's it's a real honor. Can you hear me back there in the cheap seats? This thing, not quite. That was a yes or a no. Oh, it's a yes. Okay, good. Okay, cool. Uh, so you know, let's just let's just then jump right into it. Um, I, I, First of all, this book is the first, hopefully, in a Knockwood, hopefully in a series of uh, small, accessible books. I'm trying to take what I used to write in a three, three or four hundred page book and boil it down to 180 or 90 pages and make it, you know, because everybody's working like two and three jobs and there's, you know, plus we've got to check our phones every 15 minutes and see if Trump started World War III. And, 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 and you know, who's got the time, right? So, um, so the second book, this, this one is on guns. The next one, which will be out this fall, is The Hidden History of the Supreme Court, The Betrayal of America. And then, and, thank you. and then the one coming out next spring will be The Hidden History of the Republican War on Voting. And then the one coming out, and I've written all three of those. The, the next one that's about half done right now is gonna be The Hidden History of, uh, we haven't worked out the title yet, but some variation on how monopoly is killing capitalism and, um, or, you know, killing our economy or killing everything, democracy. So, you know, step by step, we're working through these. But I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I, I flew here um, from San Francisco. In fact, my plane was an hour and a half late, uh, but, I, but I made it, you know, thank God. And, and um, as I was standing at the gate in San Francisco waiting for, for them to board the plane, for, you know, to let us on, um, the, board, the gate agent said, um, you know, people with disabilities, people with children under two, uh, people who are active duty military. You can board first. You can board before the people who paid full fare first class. You can board be before the movie stars. You can board before the politicians. You can board. Be and the reason why we honor our military like that, um, you know, outside of the kind of cyn cynical jingoism that, that uh, I think the airlines participate in to some extent, but, but there, there's actually a good reason behind that, and that is that when people join the military, they're literally volunteering to walk into, or walk, you know, walk into gunfire. And that's worthy of respect. That's, you know, worthy of honoring. And so we do that by boarding first at the airports. Um, when a police officer gets killed, we had a cop killed in Portland last year, and it kind of shut down the city, or a good chunk of the city for the funeral. Uh, because, again, these are people who have said, as my job description, I'll, I'll walk into gunfire. That's a big deal. If you were to add up the, the sum total of all the police officers who died in the line of duty and all the soldiers, U.S. soldiers worldwide, who died in the line of duty since the end of the Vietnam War, year by year by year by year, every single year, the number of children in the United States who died by gunfire is greater than the sum of those two. 
And yet nobody at the airport is saying, children under 18 are welcome to board right now early. Uh, we thank you for laying down your bodies uh, for the profits of the gun industry. So it's, uh, it's kind of a grim thing. So where did all this start? How did we get here? The, 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 how did our gun culture, in fact, come about? First, we have to acknowledge that, that, that what we call the United States, you know, our country, the United States, participated in the largest genocide in the history of the world. We killed off somewhere between 50 and 100 million Native Americans, and, you know, which is just absolutely mind-boggling. Um, yes, there have been genocides all over the world in you know, many different areas and in many different ways, but um, we're pretty unique. Here in Australia, these two countries that were basically invaded by the British are pretty unique in just wiping out Aboriginal indigenous people. And I, I, you know, the, all, those, all those brown people that, that Donald Trump, for example, is all hysterical about coming across our border um, have that you know, little bit of pigment in their skin because they have Indian roots. They have native Central and Southern American, uh, you know, uh, blood as it were, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, because the genocide was not complete in Central and South America. But you can travel across North America for days, you know, city after city, you know, and, and, and never find Native Americans, never find Native American communities. Um, this, was, this was the official policy of the British East India Company and the British government, and then the official policy of the United States government itself. You know, uh, Andrew Jackson, the president that Donald Trump has chosen to hang the picture of next to his desk, next to the Resolute desk in the Oval Office, the one president who's hanging in there, uh, you know, right next to the desk, his nickname was the Indian Killer. That's what he was famous for, you know, the Trail of Tears and all this stuff, and that was just a little piece of it. There were like, you know, hundreds of those things over, over a period of a century or so. So number one, we had this extraordinary genocide and it was facilitated by guns. If, if it wasn't for the superior military technology of guns that was brought here from Europe, we would not have been able to successfully execute that genocide. Um, so that's kind of the beginning. Within a decade, within 10 years of the first uh, well, actually, it was a little longer than that. In you know, 1492, Christopher Columbus was actually the first slaver. Although he wasn't bringing slaves here, he was, ex he was taking the Taino people. Another genocide, you know, over a 15 or 20 year period, he wiped out basically all of, all of the Indians in Hispaniola, in what we could now call Haiti and Dominican Republic, and, and exported many of them to Europe as slaves. In fact, he wrote to the king of uh, Spain saying, you know, slaves are as precious as gold, and there are many of them here. Um, so, you know, that was uh, coming up on 1500, but really in 1607, I think it was, Jamestown started um, the first kind of beachhead colony for the British East India Company. Uh, they named it after King James, who was the largest stockholder in the corporation. Um, they named the state after the Virgin Queen, Queen Elizabeth I, who in, on, in December of 16, 1601, uh, signed the charter that created the British East India Company. And uh, within 10 years of starting that colony, they, were, they had started importing people from Africa as slaves into, into North America. And, and, and actually not just Africa, I mean they were, they were importing slaves from a number of countries, people who were enslaved people from a number of different countries and of a variety of races. And there was a fair amount, particularly in the West, in the Midwest, a fair amount of the enslavement of Native Americans as well that occurred during, during that first couple hundred years. So, but, but it became a, a, a government-sponsored, government-sanctioned government, I mean, you know, there's the foundation of our economy, you know, the, 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 for you know, this long period of time. And that, you can only have slave, people, people, nobody wants to be enslaved. You can only have a slave state if you have a police state. You can't, you know, slavery just doesn't happen. It requires a police state. It requires, a, I mean, literally from the point of view of the enslaved people, a Nazi-like slave state in order to keep people enslaved. It's the only way you can do it. And that's what we had in the South. And 
So, you know, th this, this also was facilitated by guns. Guns were the superior military technology or the, mil or the, the weaponry technology that, that essentially made slavery possible. Which then leads us to, well, what's the history? I mean, this is kind of our history, and, and, and frankly, we haven't reconciled either one of those. We're just, I mean, last week there was a discussion about, you know, House Bill 40, House Resolution 40, H.R. 40, which um, would establish a commission to discuss whether or not, or if, or how, we should even have a conversation about reparations. I mean, it wasn't even, hey, let's do reparations. It was like, hey, let's talk about reparations. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the Republicans are melting down. And, and, and you know, it's, we, have not, we have not only not reconciled our, 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 our history as it has to do with slavery, but we haven't even begun to have a conversation about our, about our history with regard to the genocide of Native Americans. And, and uh, you know, I think, frankly, these are just enormous karmic burdens for our country that we have to confront. So how did the Second Amendment come about then, the question becomes? You know, how does, how does that segue into the Second Amendment? It's, it's a really interesting um, story. When the, when the Constitution was being written in Philadelphia in 1787, in the summer of 1787, the, there was a, an absolute consensus among the framers, uh, the, you know, the founders are typically referred to as the people who wrote the, wrote the Declaration and fought the Revolutionary War, and then the framers are the people who wrote the Constitution. They framed our country, essentially. So the, con the conversation among the framers was, we have to be sure when we set up this country, this new United States of America, we have to be sure that we, don't, um, that we don't end up with a situation like so many European countries have where uh, the, the, the country, the, 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 the government gets overthrown by its own military. This is a story that goes all the way back. I mean, you can take it all the way back to the Epic of Gilgamesh. You can, you know, the, 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 some of the Greek democracies, the Roman Republic in places. Um, and, you know, all the way up to today, I mean, you know, it, 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 LCC in Egypt, I mean, there's just no shortage of, of basically military coups. And, and so the question was, how do we prevent a military coup? How do we prevent the military from taking over our country? And, and there was an absolute consensus that this was a real danger. Three different states had actually written into their constitutions. The standing armies during times of peace were a, were a menace to a republic to a, what they called a Republican form of government back then, and it had nothing to do with today's political party. So they had this long discussion about this. It's fascinating. You can read it in Madison's notes on the, on the, on the, on the Constitutional Convention. And what they came up with was, okay, let's, uh, let's force Congress every two years to decide whether or not we're gonna have an army for another two years. Literally, let's just force Congress to come up with this decision. Um, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, the so-called enumerated powers part, starts out by saying, you know, Congress can appropriate money, can raise taxes, and can spend money pretty much however they want, as long as it, it's for the general welfare of the people. And then they list a bunch of things that they thought were really good ideas, you know, roads and post offices and, you know, promoting the, the useful arts and inventions by, you know, patents and things like that. And, you know, they, they go through this list. And pretty much, you know, Congress can appropriate as much money as it wants for as long as it wants for anything with one single exception, that being the Army. And they can spend as much money as they want for as long as they want for anything except the Army. Now, the Navy could be funded forever because, you know, our Navy... Uh, protected our shipping routes and, and, our, and our water borders. But in Article 1, Section 2, it says that every two years, Congress must appropriate funds for the Army. And if Congress fails to appropriate those funds, the Army goes away. And this was a really hot topic during the Constitutional Convention. And there was, and, and, and they, they came to this, then there was not a lot of debate about it. Uh, I mean, it was discussion about how do we do this, and should it be one year, or two years, or five years, or you know, all these kinds of things. 
but they wrote it into the Constitution. It's right there, right now. This is why the, the military appropriations bill is such a big deal every year. If it doesn't get passed, then you know, the Army ceases to exist, and that's why it's called must-pass legislation. It's gonna be coming up in the next few months. So then the question was, okay, if we don't have an army, you know, if Congress one day says, well, you know, we haven't fought a war in a few years, let's just let it go away. Then what do you do? What happens if we get attacked? How do we defend ourselves? I mean, there's actually a reason to have armies. And what they came up with as the solution to that was that every state would have a militia, that these militias would be, uh, you know, appropriately functioning, that they would have you know, good order and, and good discipline and, and be well stocked with ammunition and weapons and all this kind of stuff. Um, the phrase well regulated in the 1700s meant efficiently operating. And um, so, so then that, this is where the Second Amendment came from. And the original Second Amendment, uh, you know, started out just explicitly saying that standing armies during times of peace are a threat to the peace and safety of a country. And, and therefore, a well-regulated you know, the, 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 well militia will be a, essential to the, to, the, to the security of a free country. It said free country. And then it went on to say, and any man scrupulously opposed to, uh, to participating in warfare um, can be exempted from the militia. This was not about the army, this is the, the militia. And, and pretty much, and, and so, you know, it was all very clear. This was really about, you know, having a, having a military. And it's it just, the, 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 I think probably the most fascinating part of this was the Virginia Ratifying Convention, um, where this, when this came about. And, and in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, this was two years later, this was 1789, the summer of 1789. And, and several states had already ratified the convention, and which uh, ratified the Constitution. And Virginia was like the key state, because Virginia was right in the middle, up and down the East Coast. If there was no Virginia, there was no United States, it would not be a contiguous country. And um, Virginia had the power to bring the whole thing down. And so they get to Virginia, and James Madison is a Virginian, and he's kind of the father of the Constitution, and he brings this copy of the Constitution to the, to the ratifying convention and says, you know, what do you think, guys? And Patrick Henry, the, the give me liberty or give me death guy, which is so ironic because he was the largest slaveholder in the state of Virginia. <laughs> Seriously. Patrick Henry gets up and gives this just impassioned speech. He was famous as an orator. And, and he points out that in, in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and also in Article II, that Congress and the President, in different ways, um, have the power to call up the militias, that is, the individual state militias. Now, in the North, each state had a militia, and, the, and they, you know, they were sort of like the National Guard. I mean, they met every month, and they had armories, and they would do drills and things like this, but, you know, to protect the state. But in the South, it was a whole completely different thing. In the South, the militias served three purposes. The first was they were the state militia. They were there to defend the state. This would be Virginia, Georgia, North and South Carolina. Number one, the militia. Number two, they were also the police. Uh, every, pretty much everywhere except in the very, very big cities. The, the local militia were the cops. Which is, and, and number three, they were the slave patrols and uh, which I'll detail in, in just a moment, but this is, I think, one of the reasons why if you're shot in the South, odds are one in three you were shot by a cop right now in the United States. That, you know, the policing in the South literally grew out of the slave patrols. And the slave patrols were the enforcement mechanism for that police state which is necessary for slavery. In fact, in Georgia, the slave patrols were required to inspect the, the quarters of every enslaved person in that state every month. And every man between 17 and 47 had to be a member, every white man, had to be a member of the slave patrols in, the, in these southern states and, and you know, had to report for duty and they did all these things. And there were, there were exceptions, you know, if you were a judge you could get out, if you were a physician you could get out, but uh, politicians were exempted, but, but by and large, you know, pretty much every, everybody had to participate. So, so Patrick Henry gets up 
And he says, uh, you know, they, they will search that document looking for an opportunity to, pr to, to propose manumission, you know, freedom of the slaves, you know. Um, and, 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 and he points out that, you know, the president and Congress have the power to call up the militia. They can, they can, they can reach into Virginia and say, Virginia, we need your militia because we've got an uprising in Massachusetts. Or we've got a, you know, we've been attacked by Canada on the border. And, and so, you know, we've, all the Virginia militia has to go to Canada. And, and, and he pointed out, correctly by the way, that if that happened, that, you know, the, Virginia was about 50-50, white and black. And if all the slave patrols had to leave, all those well-armed men left, then, you know, there might be a slaughter. Um, he was a little, he didn't use that word, but, you know, he said, our peace and harmony will be disrupted. <laughs> so, James Madison says, you know, well, I think you're being paranoid here, and, and uh, you know, because Henry was speaking against the Second Amendment. And, and Madison says, well, I think you're being paranoid here. And, and, and Henry says, no, no, and he gives another one of these fierce speeches. I've, I've got quotes from them in the book. That, and, and, and when you read them, just imagine, you know, he's just uh, this flaming or like a preacher, you know. And, and uh, so Madison says, okay, uh, you know, what's, a, and, and keep in mind, Madison was a slaveholder too. I mean, they, 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 and these guys were peers. They were both Virginians. And George Mason got in the act. He was on Patrick Henry's side. And, and so Madison says, well, what do you want? And Patrick Henry says, change that word country in the Second Amendment to the word state so that the integrity and, and you know, whatnot of our, of our slave patrols will be recognized. And, Mad and you know, and they, so they, they got rid of the language that was for the Quakers in Pennsylvania that, you know, if you're religiously scrupulous of military service, you don't have to serve. And, and um, they got rid of the language that said standing armies during times of peace are a threat. Uh, that had already, by and large, got, been disposed of. And then they changed the word country to the word state. So in a, in a, in a literal sense, in its current form, the Second Amendment was written to protect slave, the institution of slavery in the South. So then, you know, then, then it becomes like, okay, well, you know, in 2008, in the, in the Heller decision, Scalia and his buddies discovered this individual right to own guns in the Second Amendment, and the Second Amendment became like this really big deal in our lifetimes. But if, if we were to talk to somebody who'd been around in the, and, and, you know, and, and politically aware in the 20s or the 30s or even the 40s, and ask them, um, did anybody ever discuss the Second Amendment? The answer would be no. The Second Amendment, you know, I mean, nobody talks about the Third Amendment right now, right? The Third Amendment says that the government can't force you to put soldiers in your bedroom, you know, to, to, to quarter soldiers, to, to offer them a place to live or sleep or whatever, um, you know, which was a problem during the Revolutionary War. The British did this for years. They would just come up to a house and say, you are going to house four of our soldiers. Um, so they put that into the Third Amendment. But, you know, we haven't had a conversation about the Third Amendment in a long, long time. And it turns out that, you know, there was this big debate around the Second Amendment that, that happened during the ratifying conventions, but then it kind of went away. And the states had their militias, and, and it really, that discussion really went away after, after uh, 18, roughly 1815. And the reason why, and, and we didn't have that conversation again until the 1970s. I mean, literally from, the, from, from 1815 until 1975, basically. Nobody, you, 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 it's really hard to find articles about the Second Amendment, discussions about the Second Amendment, rants about the Second Amendment, books about the Second Amendment. You know, I mean, they're out there, but they're, they're few and far between. Um, and the reason why was because um, Jefferson, uh, who became president in 1801 and left office in 1809, Thomas Jefferson was very proud of the fact that when he came into office, there were about 300,000 people in the military in the army, 300,000 men in the army in the United States, and he reduced that down to about 6,000 during his eight years in office. He was gung-ho to get rid of that standing army. I mean, he saw a day when it would just, we would be like Switzerland, no standing army. Well, they have one now, but, you know, it's, they still have the cantonal, you know, the state-by-state, state, they call them cantons, um, uh, militias. And that was his vision. But the problem was that the state militias really weren't up to snuff. And so when the War of 1812 happened, 
The British just marched right down to Washington, D.C. and burned the White House. Dolly Madison had to flee with a picture of George Washington, and they literally burned the thing, the, the White House. And there was a lot of muttering under the breath about, you know, this is all Thomas Jefferson's fault, right? He, he wiped out our army. And that was the end of the conversation about the Second Amendment. That was the end of the conversation about state militias. Um, it just went away until the 1970s. And one of the reasons that it came back in the 1970s is because in the 1970s, the, the NRA, which was, had always historically been a sportsman's organization, um, you know, I remember the, from, from the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, I remember the NRA you know, working with the Boy Scouts to teach you know, gun safety and stuff. Marksmanship, you, know, these, you could get a marksmanship merit badge, as I recall. I, you know, my recollection might be faulty, but that's my recollection. Um, but then in the 70s, they got basically taken over, I, I don't know if it's right, to, accurate to say that they were taken over by the gun manufacturers or they just decided to get in bed with the gun manufacturers, but that's, you know, that's what happened, basically. And the consequence of that is that suddenly there was this discussion about the Second Amendment. And, and they started laying the groundwork for, for the Hell, ultimately the, the Heller decision you know, with think tanks and articles and all this kind of stuff, uh, talking about how, how they're, they're actually, you know, the founders actually wanted there to be this, this, uh, this right. So, um, and, and, and in fact, uh, it, one of the other discussions that we have right now that I find absolutely fascinating, um, whenever I bring up guns on my program, there will invariably be somebody calling in um, who says, but wait a minute, didn't the founders put the Second Amendment in there? Didn't they give us the right to own guns just in case the government ever becomes so oppressive that we need to take it down? And, you know, again, you go back and, and read Madison's notes on the, on the Constitutional Convention. There was not a word about that, right? You read the ratifying conventions, not a word about that. Um, or, if there, or if there was, it was considered crackpot stuff. I mean, they were, they were doing everything they could to create a government that would never be oppressive, that, you know, splitting the legislature into two parts, giving them different responsibilities and powers, different amounts of time in office, um, creating the, the Electoral College, which was supposed to be a council of wise elders. If you read, uh, no, seriously, read. Alexander Hamilton, or maybe it was Madison, wrote about this. I think it's in Federalist 29. Uh, uh, were, you know, were justifying the Electoral College and said that it would prevent their ever becoming or ever arising in America a person of poor character as president. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, read it. It's, it's right there in the Federalist Papers. So they had done everything they could possibly think of to make sure that this government was going to be a good government, you know, that, that it would be, a, this would be a good and decent nation and would get better and better and better as time went on rather than worse and worse. And nobody was thinking, gee, we need to arm the populace just in case we, the politicians who are writing the Constitution, you know, people really should be able to shoot at us. You know, I mean, no, they weren't thinking like that. But then in the 70s, this, this uh, teenager wrote this op-ed that was published in the NRA magazine that said that that's what the founders had in mind. And this mythology just kind of grew, you know, and then it got picked up by the, the, by the John Birch Society, which had really exploded in the, 19, in the 50s and 60s, you know, when Fred Koch started heavily funding it and, and uh, you know, in response by and large to the 1954 Brown versus Board, you know, uh, segregation or integration in our schools, ending segregation in our schools decision. That, you know, then you, those of you old enough to remember, remember the you know, late 50s and throughout the 60s, these billboards all over America that said impeach Earl Warren. Well, he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and he was the guy who signed that decision. And, you know, how dare he, right? So the echoes of slavery are still with us. But it literally just, you know, the idea that, that uh, you know, if, if anybody ever suggests to you that the Second Amendment there is there so that we can take down the government if it ever becomes oppressive, just, just tell them, you know, if you think that you can take on the U.S. military with your little AR-15 or, you know, a couple of 45s on your hip, let me introduce you to a few Afghans or uh, Iraqis, you know, um, which is, I mean, you know, our military is pretty ferocious and, and can, you know, it's just... So that, 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 was just, that was a fantasy, just, just for the record. And then there was the myth of the Old West. 
The, 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 the myth of the Old West is an extraordinary one because there were, what happened um, was during the Civil War, you know, pretty much everybody got drafted. And there were, there were a number of Southern men who had been drafted into the, into the Army, into the Confederate Army, and, and they were just like evil people. I mean, they were just like these, you know, uh, many of them were slaveholders, um, but, you know, some were not. But they were, they were literally robbers and rapists and murderers and thieves. I mean, literally. And when they, and under the cover of military activity, and this happens in every war, but under the cover of military activity, they would, you know, if, if the Confederates took a city, they would, the, the soldiers would go in and they'd rape the women and they'd steal everything of value and they would kill the, you know, men who were old enough to, to be a military threat and just, you know, commit murder. And the, the, the North was a little more reserved about this, but the Confederacy was pretty, pretty, at least pieces of it in, in places, was pretty famous for it. And so when these guys went back home after the war, their neighbors had served with them and seen what they had done. They had seen the war crimes that these guys had committed. And basically, the, the communities in the South said to these guys, we don't want you here. You know, that they didn't, they didn't want them living there. And so they, they left. They said, okay, I'm out of here. And they went to, out west where there's the land of opportunity. And this is, this is where Jesse James came from. He was one of these bushwhackers, one of these, one of these Confederate soldiers who was a, a you know, murderer, robber, rapist. Um, and, and, and in fact, if you go down through the list, and they're, they're all listed in the book, of you know, famous, famous, famous Wild West person after person after person, they were just these Confederate criminals. But there was, at that time, you know, the, 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 uh, the newspapers were growing, the, the Saturday Evening Post started publication, I think in the, in the mid-18, like in the 1830s, there about 1840s. Um, I'd have to go back and look for the date, but it's in, it's in the book. But they were looking for stories that would sell magazines and that would sell newspapers. And so these, these New York writers would write, you know, hey, the James gang just robbed a bank, you know, oh boy, well, let's, you know, let's fictionalize that, which is what they did. And they turned them into these, like, noble heroes, so, you know, sort of like with Bonnie and Clyde in the 1930s, turned them into noble heroes when really they were just psychopaths. <laughs> and, I mean, literally. And, and so we've got this whole mythology that we grew up with, with these John Wayne movies and all this stuff, and it's just, it's all BS. You know, the, shoot, the shootout at the OK Corral, well, actually, you know, this guy got shot in the back in an alley. I mean, you know, it's just that, that that's more the, the kind of thing that was happening. And, and so we've got this mythology that has to do with guns that young men grew up with in the United States, basically since the late 1800s. Um, and, you know, defining masculinity in some ways in terms of guns and proficiency with guns. And this has been a real destructive piece of this, frankly. Uh, Wyatt Earp, uh, you know, some of the sheriffs, the, the famous Western sheriffs, Wyatt Earp, he wasn't so much a bad guy, but, but he was, you know, the, the sign outside his town, was it Tombstone or, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting which town he, he ran, but whatever it was, it's in the book. Um, the sign said, you know, check your guns at the sheriff's office and get a receipt. Right? They had gun control in the Wild West. Pretty much every community in the Wild West had gun control. So, you know, we, we need to break down some of this mythology. We need to, we need to, to you know, let it see the light of day. Um, I, I also think, you know, somebody was asking me earlier today, um, why is it that you think, you know, why do you think it is that A, virtually all of these mass murders, these mass killings, are being committed by men, number one. And number two, why have they been going up in frequency basically since the 1980s? And, you know, this is, now the, the, the first part, there's, there's clearly an association between testosterone and violence. Um, 
You know, I remember years ago, a friend of mine who was a professor at the Harvard Medical School, uh, he and I were giving some lectures, this was in the 90s, in the early 90s, on uh, ADHD. And we were having lunch one day, and we were talking about uh, uh, ADHD kids getting in trouble with drugs, and uh, that whole controversy at that time. And he said, well, you know, cocaine and heroin are terrible, but I'll tell you what the most dangerous drug in the world is, the one that's been responsible for more murders, more wars, more genocide, more killing, more mayhem than anything else, testosterone. That's the most dangerous dark drug in the world. And, and yeah, I think that that's true. We've got this kind of testosterone poisoned culture. So that's a piece of it. Now we've got, you know, add to this, this new phenomenon of incels, these, these young right wing men who've never had sex. And so they want to go out and kill women because they've never had sex. I mean, we've had several mass murders done by these, by these and there's a movement, you know, there's, there's message boards for them to sit around and nurse their, 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 their anger. It's like, oh man, get a life, people. Um, but the other thing is that there was, there was a study done, on, and, and I learned about this after I wrote the book, so this is not in the book, but I published an article about this maybe, I don't know, two months ago, that you can easily uh, Google. Um, there was a study that was done back, I don't know, six, eight, ten years ago, or thereabouts, where they wanted to know how handling a gun affected men. They did this with women, by the way, subsequently, and found that it didn't have much impact with women. But this was, this was with men. And there's, there's a measure of aggression that they use in psychology, and that they've used in psychology for years and years. It's a, it's a tool that was developed, I think, back in the 1950s. My, my article has links to the, the origins of this all. And, and here's how the study was put together. It's really cool. Um, they would bring these, these uh, young men in, and uh, tell them that they were doing a study on taste, on sensitivity of taste buds, and how the sensitivity of taste buds are affected by time and by thought and things like that. And so they would start out and they'd say, here, here's a glass of water, it's got one drop of Tabasco sauce in it. Taste this. And so the young man would, okay, I got it, okay, so set it down. Okay, now we're going to wait 15 minutes and we're going to have you sample it again and see how that alters your taste. And during that 15 minutes, we're just going to fill some time here. And so we'd like you to do this. Now, half the group was given literally a children's toy. It was called a mouse trap. It was a fairly complex toy that had a lot of pieces and stuff. And they asked them to, to take it apart, put it back together, whatever, and write a sentence or two about it. The other half, that was the control group. Oh, and, and they also took, every, they took a saliva sample from everybody, and you can measure testosterone from saliva. They told them it was for, how do you, you know, are you salivating in response to, uh, to the Tabasco, right? And we're going to measure how much saliva you have. But really what they were looking at was testosterone. The other group was given a gun to handle for 15 minutes, an unloaded gun. And after 10 or 15 minutes of handling this gun, playing with it, you know, fiddling with it, whatever, uh, write a sentence or two about it, and then we're going to give you the, the Tabasco again. And they did that. And then after they were all done, or after the, the subjects, the people being tested, thought they were all done, they thought, this, okay, the study's all over. The scientists would just kind of casually, and this was the key to the whole, this is how you measure a tendency toward aggression. They would, they would uh, take a fresh glass of water, and a bottle of Tabasco sauce and set it in front of the person that they had just, you know, they had just finally taken their second saliva sample from them and said, okay, we're all done. By the way, here's a glass of water and here's some Tabasco sauce. You can set up the water for the next person. And you can put as much Tabasco in the water as you want. And what they found was that the men who had handled guns put twice as much Tabasco in the water as the men who had handled the toy and their testosterone levels were measurably higher. So, I mean, this goes way beyond the small penis gun club, you know, which, which I, I invented some years ago, and now it has a website and a Twitter following, actually. <laughs> Seriously, you can look it up. And I own the websites, you know, smallpenisgunclub.com.org. <laughs> they, they redirect to different places. 
And I, you know, when I did that 10 years ago, I did it because I thought it was funny, but it's really kind of not. Um, you know, it's like, because it turns out testosterone is like, there, there's this real thing. But the other part of it was that they also discovered, and this was a whole completely separate study done by different people, but they also found that, um, and this was for, true of both men and women, that when people fire guns, when they shoot them, they get a rush, which is almost identical to the rush that you get on a, on a, on a roller coaster. You get this blast of endorphins, which are these, these feel-good chemicals, these, these uh, naturally occurring opiates, essentially, that, that make you feel kind of high and powerful and make the pain go away. And you get a blast of adrenaline, which raises your blood pressure and your heartbeat rate and gives you, you know, throws you kind of into fight or flight, which is probably the reason why these mass shooters, once they start, they don't stop immediately as soon as they see a body blown apart, um, and, and, you know, which would horrify the average person. Um, at that point, they're so cranked. And so, you know, this is, this is one of the reasons why I think it's such a big deal that last week, for the first time ever in the United States, Congress debated, or at least the House of Representatives, the, Mitch McConnell will not allow this conversation in the Senate, but the House of Representatives debated, um, and I believe they passed it. If they didn't pass it, it's probably going to pass next week a piece of legislation to fund, for the first time, research into the relationship between guns and violence in the United States. <laughs> we've never looked at this. And, and, and one of the reasons that we've never looked at this is because back in the, I think it was in the 80s, it was more or less, you know, around that time, um, this congressman by the name of Dickey slipped what is referred to as the Dickey Amendment into, a, into, a, into an appropriations bill, a must-pass piece of appropriations legislation, which makes it illegal for the federal government to research guns and violence. It's against the law, right? The, the Centers for Disease Control is specifically prohibited from investigating guns. It's great, yeah, it's great, it's crazy stuff. So anyway, the, uh, uh, so what do we do about this? I just wanna to toss out some suggestions and then, we'll, and then I'll take your questions. Um, Number one, there is this, well, let me start back up a little bit. In Australia, there was a, a massacre in Port Arthur, um, uh, Tasmania, in, in Australia, in 96, as I recall. And some of the pictures from that uh, of bodies blown apart um, got into the Australian media. And the Australian people were so horrified by this that they just said enough already, and they passed some reasonable gun control legislation and launched a ma massive nationwide gun buyback program. And as a consequence of that, for years and years and years, right up until like last year, I think, you know, they didn't have another mass shooting. And suicide rates went down like 70%, um, deaths from suicide, um, because, you know, yeah, which is half, by the way, it's half of all gun deaths. Um, and I, in fact, I opened the book with a story of my best friend in high school, Clark Stinson, who I dedicated the book to. Um, it was drafted, or he was going to be drafted, to, during the Vietnam War. This was in 1968 or 9. And he came home from basic training, and it was Christmas, and he came over to, to where I was staying, to the house that I was living at, and just kind of poured his heart out about how terrified he was that they were going to send him over to Vietnam, and he didn't know what to do, and... And I didn't know what to say, you know. I mean, I, I listened and, and commiserated, but I just didn't have any, I, did, I just didn't know what to say. And Clark went home, and the next day there was a gun shop down the street. He went down, he bought a little pistol, took it back to his room, sat on his bed, put it in his mouth, and blew the back of his head all over the wall. And, uh, you know, that afternoon his wife called me up, just hysterical. So this is, this is half of our gun deaths, our suicides. This is a real, real big issue. And then, of course, there's an enormous number of accidental deaths as well. And, 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 but the suicide deaths, the, the, the reason why reducing the number of guns in circulation, there's an absolute relationship between the number of guns in circulation and the number of gun deaths and woundings. Uh, and it just makes sense. I mean, this is just logical. We are 4% of the world's population. We have 50% of the world's guns in civilian hands. That's insane. You know, that's, that's like the definition of insanity. So typically when people commit suicide or try to commit suicide, you know, they'll slit their wrist or they'll take a bunch of pills or something. 
you know, very rarely are they successful. Not very rarely, but you know, there's a, a higher percentage of people who get saved or who decide, you know, have, have second thoughts. I, I heard an interview um, some months ago on, uh, I think it was on NPR, with a, uh, with a fellow who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and was one of the few to survive. He broke, his, broke both his legs, broke his hips, smashed his spine, he's in a wheelchair now, but he survived. And, and the person uh, interviewing him said, you know, what was the first thought through your mind when you jumped off the bridge? And he said, uh, you know, oh crap, <laughs> I really don't want to do this. But he's already off the bridge and on his way to the water. And that, you know, that, that remorse, that regret is real frequent with people who attempt suicide. But if you attempt suicide with a gun, there's no opportunity to have that remorse because, you know, Guns are pretty fatal. So, uh, with accidental deaths, uh, it, it, this is just like, this is like God talking to me. Um, yesterday, I was in Los Angeles and uh, doing the same basic talk here in, for an audience in Los Angeles at uh, UCLA. And after I was done, I was going to dinner with some friends and I, I called an Uber to pick me up at UCLA and take me to the restaurant where I was meeting them. And uh, the Uber driver, uh, this woman named Nadia, picked me up. And she, as we're driving along, she says, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, I'm, or why are you here? Why were you at UCLA? And I said, well, I was here giving a talk about a book I wrote. And she's like, oh, you write books? And I was like, yeah. I've been. And she says, what's the book about? And I said, it's called The Hidden History of Guns in the Second Amendment. And it's about how uh, we're being basically you know, killed by our own guns. There's just like, you know, we've got to do something about the, 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 all these guns that are just filling. We've got more guns than people in the United States. And she said, I have to tell you a story. She said, my, my daughter, my 23-year-old daughter, uh, was uh, having uh, panic attacks and just anxiety. And she was having a hard time sleeping as a result of this. And so her doctor prescribed a sleeping pill for her. And I told her, don't take that stuff, it'll make you crazy. You know, there's all these stories about sleeping pills and, and bad behavior. And she didn't, you know, and she, for a couple of weeks she listened to mom, but finally she just said, mom, I've just I've got to get a good night's sleep. She took a sleeping pill, the first one, took a sleeping pill, this is the story Nadja told me yesterday, took a sleeping pill, her husband had a loaded gun in the drawer in the bureau in their bedroom. Her husband had fallen asleep, she was trying to fall asleep. She apparently got up, got the gun, and apparently accidentally from the way that the gun discharged, you know, with the, what the police said, killed herself, shot herself with this gun. And probably didn't even realize it because you know some of these sleeping pills you just don't you know, you don't have no, you have no recollection of what's going on and she's like in a fog. And as she's telling the story, she's getting more and more teary. And finally, as she just kind of hit the very end of it, she just starts sobbing. And here she's we're driving down um, Sunset Boulevard, you know, and, and she's just sobbing and sobbing in the car. And, and I'm like, oh my God, I you know, Nadja, I'm so sorry. I, I don't I, you know I don't know what to say. And she's. And this went on for like five or six blocks before she could get it together. And I said, that's a terrible story. When did that happen? And she's like, it happened four months ago. And I mean, I just can't even, I'm, I'm you know, Louise and I have three kids. I can't imagine losing a child. And, and to a gun, to an unnecessary, you know, something unnecessary. The fact of the matter is, if you have a gun in your house, the odds are 500% higher that somebody in your house will die because of that gun. You know, and this is like, we're killing ourselves with the thing that we think we're using to protect ourselves. It's, it's, it's nuts. So, anyhow, I started telling the story about Australia, and then I kind of got off on that suicide tangent, but back to Australia. Uh, the picture has horrified people. The, the kids in Newtown now have this new hashtag, hashtag show my picture. And they've got these stickers that you can, that they put it, you can put on the back of your driver's license. It says show my, show my picture, hashtag show my picture. And what it means is, what they know, what the kids from, from or, or uh, not Newtown, Parkland, what the kids from Parkland know, because it happened to their friends, their neighbors, their, you know, their acquaintances, 
is that when somebody gets shot with a gun, particularly a high-powered gun, particularly a weapon of war kind of gun like the, like the, uh, the AR-15, it's not like you see in the movies. It's not like, oh, oh, fall down, right? And maybe a little blood seeps out. No, if you, you know, if you get shot in the shoulder, a big chunk of your shoulder goes flying off, you know, and your arm falls off. If you get shot in the arm, your hand goes flying across the room and blood is spraying everywhere. You know, it's, I mean, these, these weapons are insanely destructive. In, in Newtown, they, some of those kids, their bodies were in so many pieces that it took them days to put them back together, and the first responders are still in therapy over this. This is how these weapons work. And so these kids are saying, damn it, if I get shot, show my picture. Show people what that looks like. And I think, you know, you know what I think is totally insane? The power of really grotesque pictures is something that we absolutely know, right? The, the, the forced pregnancy crowd has been doing this ever since 1974. So they're, if, and they're standing up there with pictures of aborted fetuses all the time, and the newspapers are reprinting these pictures of these, of these pictures and these folks, and that, but it's, but it's too, our sensibilities are too delicate for us to look at the pictures of somebody killed by a gun? Really? Um, so, I, you know, I think number one, we need, we need to, we need our media actually to start showing some of these pictures, because, you know, I know that, you know, from the Parkland experience that some of those, some of those families actually wanted those pictures to be shown. And the media is like, oh, we can't do that, you know. Uh, well, you know, no, we, we do show gross pictures in America, number one. Number two, uh, there are some great high-tech solutions. There, there's a company in Austria, and a, or in Switzerland, and a company in, in Germany that have come up, two different companies that have come up with a couple of different guns, pistols, that um, one of them recognizes your grip. I didn't realize until I was writing this book and researching this, this gun company that your grip is unique, just like your fingerprint. And so the gun recognizes your grip, and if, if you're not the person holding the gun that the gun's been programmed to, it won't shoot, period, full stop. And there's another company that makes a gun that's got an RFID reader, uh, in a, a chip reader in it. And if you're wearing the chip, like in your pocket, like a key fob, if you've got you know, a car that you, you touch the car and it unlocks, um, it's the same way with the gun. Or they actually sell a ring and a, and a wristwatch that you can wear that, that, will, that will do that. Companies, a couple of companies in the United States tried to import these guns and sell them. And I tell the story of who they were and how it happened in the book. And they had to stop because they were getting death threats. So you can't buy those guns in the United States. They're widely available in Europe. And then finally, the solution that you've heard me talk about on the radio many, many times is, uh, and this is where I'm going to wrap this up and, and I'll toss it open to questions if anybody has any questions. Um, and the third one is the, the, uh, to, to regulate guns the way we regulate cars. You know, in the 1920s, cars started killing people. We, we, we had, yeah, thank you. But, but let me tell the story. In the 1920s, you could buy a car and drive it anywhere you wanted with no driver's license, no registration, no insurance, no nothing. And the result of that was a lot of people who didn't know how to drive were driving cars and they were killing people. Now, cars aren't even designed to kill people like guns are. You know, it was accidental. But, you know, going, cars are for transportation, not for killing. But it was happening. It was, you know, people were being killed. And so the question was, what do we do about this? And we developed this on a state-by-state -state basis, by the way. This is not federal. To this day, it's state-by-state. -state. We came up with this three-part solution. Number one, from the time the car is made until the time it's destroyed, there is a constant chain of custody. We always know who's responsible for that car. So we know who's responsible if that car is misused. It's called the, you know, the, the VIN number and, the, and registration. And every year you have to renew your registration with the state. Number two, get a driver's license. You know, prove that you know how to drive, take a driving test, and prove that you know what the laws are, pass a written test. And number three, and this is the, something that every Republican should love, it's a, the so-called free market solution, let's have liability insurance. I think it's a nuts that, the, you know, if, if uh, Adam Lanza in Newtown had mowed down those kids driving an SUV maliciously, every one of their families would have gotten a million dollars from Geico, but because he shot them with a gun, nobody got even burial expenses, and people got nothing. And, you know, there, we don't want our government 
snooping into our lives so deeply that they're, going to, they're trying to predict whether or not you, know, you or I are going to commit a crime. Right? We don't want our government being that deeply inside our lives. But there is an entire industry that does that. It's called the insurance industry. If you want to buy life insurance, they're going to ask, do you smoke? How old are you? you know, what's your lifestyle? How often do you drink? You know, things like that. And they're going to look at your, at your, probably at your social media. They're certainly going to look at your medical records. You want health insurance? Same thing. You want, you want uh, car insurance? Do you have any DUIs? So why not have liability? You know, and, 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 and if somebody does have a bunch of DUIs, they can't get insurance. They can't get insurance. You can't drive. It's real simple. So why don't we have liability insurance for guns? This just seems so logical. And it's like, as I said, this is the free market solution. So put these things together. So that's my rant, and, and thank you so much for, for listening to it. I really appreciate it. And again, super thanks to KBCS and Elliott Bay Books and all these folks. And thank you so much for being here tonight. And if anybody has questions, we've got some microphones here, and I would be glad to answer them. And we can do this for 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'm going to go out and sign books uh, outside. Yep, we have about 20 minutes, so. 15 or 20 minutes, so please is that is that here. By the way, is that okay with regard to the time? I've... That sounds perfect. Okay, yeah, that's, good. That, that's perfect. And uh, just a reminder, Elliott Bay books are set up in the lobby if you'd like to get a book to be signed. But please, I see a first question over there. Are you the first questioner? Go for it. There's a microphone right there. It's all yours. Hey, Tom, I feel like I'm living in a dream right now. Thank like you. Um, thank you for the incredible talk. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, but um, I'm also from Tokyo, Japan, originally. And uh, as much as I love living in the Pacific Northwest, meeting wonderful people like you, um, I have to admit the biggest cultural shock I've had in coming to the US is, of course, learning about this gun culture. What do you think uh, we can do better in promoting uh, among uh, people in this country who never maybe haven't had a chance to visit other countries like Japan, Australia, or other countries with much less gun crime. Uh, what do you think, what, what kind of practical thing do you think we can do to promote that sense of awareness and also uh, uh, helping Americans to emulate from other countries right. better practice. No, I'm not saying Japan's perfect either. No, no, I get it. I get it. And 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 gun crime in the in Japan is is so low. It's it's you know compared to the United States, it's it's, it's mind-boggling. The statistics are in the book. I'm sorry, I can't cite them off the top of my head. But um, you're absolutely right. And and I think that it's a, it's kind of a two-step process. It's education. We need to t uh, wake people up to how they've been lied to about guns, to why we have you know. You know, where the history of the Second Amendment and all this kind of stuff. Number one, we need to educate people. Number two, we need to show people the horrors of it. And I think basically that's happening right now. And I salute the Newtown kids, or the Parkland kids in particular for this. Um, in, the, in 1995, the most powerful lobby in America was the tobacco lobby. And you, nobody crossed the tobacco lobby. You know, Mike Pence was writing op-eds about how tobacco doesn't actually cause cancer. Isn't that wonderful stuff? <laughs> Honest to God. And, and then in the late 90s, there were all these lawsuits that, that extracted out of the tobacco lobby proof that they had known since the 40s that this stuff caused cancer and, they, and it was highly addictive, and they covered it up. And all these lawsuits exposed this. And, I, and, and frankly, I think the same thing is happening right now. It's not so much the lawsuits, although they're coming, but the same thing is happening with regard to guns in the United States. People are waking up to, to the line of... BS that they've been shoveled from, you know. So I think, frankly, in five years that the NRA is going to have the same power that the tobacco lobby has now, which is minimal. Yeah. Um, but, uh, hopefully, yes. I have a question, but it's not about guns. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, but let's, let's, the rest, of, since you're there. Okay. But for everybody else, if you have a question, let's keep it to guns is tonight. Okay. Any other topic you can call my show. It's a question I've been wanting to ask you, and this seems like a good chance. Um, so I, uh, I'm so impressed with all of our presidential candidates on the Democratic side, and so I listen to your show a lot. I make sure I, you know, I stay positive on all of them. I have a young uh, adult daughter who reads Facebook a lot, like a lot of young adult people do, and she, um, she, she is disturbed and concerned about what one of my super favorite candidates, Kamala Harris, 
ha uh, has done in the past as a prosecutor. And I would like to know, as we all look at the campaign season, best ways, advice you might have for talking with our adult young people as they come into voting, how, you know, how to address what they're seeing on Facebook. I don't even know this stuff about Kamala Harris. I just know she's a fabulous person and a great candidate. But I I'd like to have your ideas about how to respond and encourage her to look at this great candidate right. and all the candidates in a positive way. That's a good way. question. Each, each one of the candidates has a website. Yeah. They, on their websites, if they're any good at all as a candidate, they have their positions and their background and their histories. You know, you can, you can look a lot of this stuff up. I don't, I don't want to speak directly to Kamala Harris as a, yeah. as a candidate. I, you know, um, I, I'm with you. Any of these people, any of these 24 of them now, are better than this orange monster we've got. So, well, so I don't have a, a specific answer other than encouraging them to do their homework, you know, encourage them to do a deep yeah. dive into it. How do you feel they're, the candidates, Democratic candidates, are doing on the gun issue? Well, well Eric Swalwell has made positions. it kind of the cornerstone of his campaign. Um, we'll see how this works out. I, I frankly don't know candidate by candidate what they're, okay. where they stand on the issues. Thank you. Yes, sir. Editorial comment. It would have been nice if you could have finished the sentence when you were on Bill Maher on Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Bless you. The, I didn't uh, want to be the guy who interrupts the, the woman sitting next to me. You know, there's like this, this is, and I, and I was just sitting there like, biting my tongue. Anyway. Seattle played a real pivotal role in the Tobacco Institute, which you just mentioned, working with Surgeon General Coop. And with the NRA kind of falling, what we saw with the Tobacco Institute was when they lost their rudder, it was fairly easy to go after the tobacco companies. With the NRA beginning to implode, is there anything we can do to help the NRA go broke faster. <laughs> I, you know, I guess, you know, take, take the stories about the, the war between Ollie North and, and Wayne LaPierre, two, two just absolutely wonderful people, and, <laughs> and, and, and share them far and wide. Uh, you know, it's a great question. I, I'm sorry I don't have a glib answer, but I, I think the question kind of answers itself. I, th they're in the process of going down. Yeah, and, and I appreciate quick questions. Thank you so much for short questions. Sir. Hi. Um, I understand that one of the issues in the state of Oregon that caused the Republican state legislatures to walk out is a gun safety law. Yep. Um, can you comment, compare, contrast, uh, or otherwise uh, speak to the 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 current thing that's happening in Oregon as compared to when the Democrats walked out in Wisconsin a few years ago? You know, I, I, unfortunately I can't. The thing that happened in Oregon has happened in the last week and a half or so, and I've been on the road doing this book tour, and I haven't, you know, it's something that I'd love to talk to Jefferson Smith about or somebody who's in Oregon and really focused on Oregon politics. I think it's, um, it's fascinating, though. I mean, you know, the, the Republicans are, like, in hiding, and, and now... And this is where it gets bizarre. Now you've got these, uh, you know, right-wing white supremacist uh, gun-toting, you know, the, the small penis gun club out there saying that that they are that they are going to protect them from the police, right? I mean, it's just like it's like the level of fantasy and bizarreness is just continuing to spiral out of control. Um, how how specifically that may compare to what happened in Wisconsin? I I I don't have a specific answer. I'm sorry, sir, over here, or ma'am. Next person over here. Um, I'm going to tell a story. Please I, make it very brief. Okay. It has to do with guns. I recently had the opportunity to travel in Iran. Mm -hmm. And it was an outstanding, wonderful experience. The people were very kind and welcoming. And inevitably, I got the question, where are you from? And I'd say, America. And they'd say, welcome. We love America. We're glad you're here with one exception. I was in a taxi, and the taxi driver, we were driving, he asked the question, and I said, America, and he said, oh, you guys shoot each other over there. What the could whole I say? world knows. What could I say? Yeah. What could I say? Iran, and I was in a country where no individual owns a gun. Wow. Right. wow. A lot of the police officers don't even carry guns. Yeah. Yeah. Your comments. Well, I, I, I think I don't 
it stands on its own. I mean, your story is brilliant, and thank you for sharing that with us. And, and you know, hopefully one day in America, we will not be the gun capital of the world, or we won't be the, the place where more and more people are dying from suicide, homicide, and accidental deaths than any place else on Earth. I mean, it's just uh, for any other developed country on Earth. Sir, yes. thanks Hi. for that story. I was going to ask you about how to loosen the NRA's grip on Congress, but given you're saying that it's on the, on the way down, I want to ask a different question, which is, how can we address the fact that so many unjustified police shootings seem to have a real racial component to it? Yeah. Well, as I said, I think, I think that this is, yeah, amen. I think this is, this is the, you know, th this, is, this is the legacy of, of racism, genocide, slavery, white supremacy, um, and all the various forms it's taken over the years um, and all its various incarnations, you know, right up to, to the forced sterilization movements in the 1920s and Woodrow Wilson playing, uh, uh, you know, the, the KKK recruiting film, Birth of a Nation, in, in the White House, you know, in 19, whatever it was, 13, I think it was. And, and uh, the, I, I think the main thing that, with regard to that, that we need to be doing. This is a problem. This is a problem though the black community is suffering from, but it's a problem within the white community. And it's a conversation that the white community needs to have with itself about what the hell we're doing here. Yeah. And, and I keep trying to start that conversation on my show and sometimes it's like, you know, pulling, t yeah. pulling whatever, but... Um, th yeah, this, there's this, a this. lot of denial among yeah. white people about what's yeah. going on. And so we need to be talking, you know, th those of us who are white people need to be talking to our friends who are white people and say, hey, let, you know, wake the hell up, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Sir. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real honor. Thanks for helping preserve at least some of my sanity in this crazy time. So. You're welcome. Only some of it I have left. But, it's, um, it's how I preserve my sanity, too, is by yeah. doing this. Yeah. I, so you, you touched on this very briefly, and maybe I'll know more when I read the book, which I have over there. But um, <clears throat> I still don't get it. To me, my reading of the Second Amendment says that based on how they, it is done now, almost no one in this country is allowed to have guns. The Second Amendment doesn't allow them to have guns. It disallows them to have guns unless they are part of a well-regulated well militia. Now, you said that in the day when they wrote it, well-regulated meant, you know, efficiently... Uh, uh, yeah, properly functioning. Pro properly functioning, functioning or efficiently, yeah. you know, something like that. But I don't see most of the gun owners falling under any definition of uh, well-regulated right. or this, efficiently This, this is why the Heller decision so, is so bizarre. So they don't get guns based on the Second Amendment the way I read it. Yeah, and I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you, and 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 uh, you know we're not going to see that issue probably revisited until after a the NRA goes down and b the, the composition of the Supreme Court changes, um, you know, and, and which is which is a shameless plug. Um, I you know my next book is the hidden history of the Supreme Court, the betrayal of democracy, and there's a chapter <laughs> I'll, in there. About I'll, the I'll, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, Tom. Uh, my name is Cynthia Lynette. I have an art show that is about to open. It is called The Gun Show. Oh, great. Give it a plug. It is 140 paintings. Uh, all of my images come from Google. I did not make up anything. It's a sobering look at gun ownership in our country. It's being sponsored by Medea Benjamin of Code Pink, and it will be there from July 2nd to the 27th. I'll be there every day. A lot of peace advocacy groups are going to be there. Jul yeah, tell us again where. ANT Gallery in Seattle Center. It's right across from the water fountain. And um, and you have please, a website for it also? Uh, it all can be found on Facebook. The okay. whole show is on Facebook. Gun I put a painting on every day and talk about what I found. We also have to get rid of all those cutesy guns for kids. Yeah. They have to be outlawed. We yeah. cannot have that anymore. Yeah. I'm with and you. I hope you'll put me on your show and interview me. This is an important <laughs> issue. I think we just did. <laughs> I think we just did. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Thanks. Sir. Driver's license and gun licenses, huh? 
Well, we already do this in, in more than half our states. If you want to have a concealed carry permit, you've got to sh yeah. prove you can shoot. You've got to prove you know the law, and they give you a little ID, and in Texas, you can use it to vote. We had a lot of um, publicity in the last uh, couple of weeks about um, affordable housing and the Plymouth Housing Group, uh, which started uh, about 35 years ago when a bunch of people got concerned about homeless people sleeping in the door with a church. So they grabbed their paint, roll paint rollers and did something. That's how that all started. It got 45 million bucks this last week from the corporations that are concerned about that. So I'm wondering, um, how about us turning in our driver's licenses until that legislation passes <laughs> to get to license guns in the same way we I don't license think you're going to have a long no. list yes. of people who are ready to give up their driver's <laughs> license. But, but the larger, you know, the, 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 the meta story that you're talking about yeah. basically is strike, right? It's, it's, it's citizen action. You know, how can, how can we do this? And, and I see this happening all over the country right Good. now. So it's a great point. Thank you Good. very much for that. Sir. Hi. Hi, my name's uh, Bill Ryan. And um, I just have kind of a question. You, you seem to have a running class analysis, which I really appreciate, and a running race analysis with your acknowledgement of <clears throat> the uh, uh, genocide of mm -hmm. the natives in this country that just is often overlooked. Yeah. I, I was kind of curious if you uh, drive a link between this uh, inability for young people in this country today to see past the future. And I just will want to quickly elaborate on yeah, this. Yeah, please, because we have four minutes left yeah, so, before they're going to start throwing us uh, out. So we have these, uh, a lot of these young school shooters are young white guys, a lot of these young inner city uh, uh, gang shooters are young black guys. But one commonality they have is they live in this grossly unequal economy. And yes. uh, it's one that I think many young people feel uh, that has robbed them and me, us, of our future. And it's based on this myth of meritocracy. And I'm just wondering if you... No, you're absolutely if, right. If you still and there's a chapter you. about that in my book. Okay. The, the work of uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in the UK, they created this thing called the Equality Trust, equalitytrust.co.uk. Um, and they've published three books now, Why Inequality Matters, The Spirit Level, and then they've got a third one. I can't remember the title of it. And what they proved, and they did this looking at country to country to country, and they did it at comparing all the 50 states in the United States, is that in, as inequality goes up, gun violence goes up, suicides go up, homicides go up, teenage pregnancy goes up, sexually transmitted diseases go up, mental illness goes up, which you would say, what the hell does that, have? mental illness goes up, um, lack of so so social cohesion goes up, um, the participants in governance goes down. I mean, you know, the inequality is probably the most toxic driver of the vast majority of our social ills. And, and frankly, I think much of the radical inequality that you can see in the United States right now, which did not exist in 1979, you can lay right at the feet of Ronald Reagan's you know, tax cuts that, that, that were doubled down on by Bush and by Trump. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I'm sorry, you're going to have to be the last question because we, we do have a, a hard limit here to get out. Two things. I'm the chair of the Democrats of the 44th District, and we did a resolution on gun control that did require that you do training, that you get a insurance, that you have a license to cool. carry. So Good on I you. recommend all of you to go to your district Democrat meeting and ask them to pass that resolution. And if they need a copy of it, they can contact the 44th LD, and I'll see too if they get it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Two. In regard to the statement that you made with regard to reparations, there's an excellent book out there called The Shadow of Slavery, Pinage in the South, from 1901 to 1969. It is an absolutely excruciating read. I can't finish the book because it is so heart-wrenching. I would like to see you take that on and make the people of this country understand what the, the black population in this country has been living with recently, because 1969 is not that long ago. Yeah, well, I, like I said, we, you know, we, white people in particular need to be having this conversation. It is, I think, well, I, I think I've said enough about it, and you said it very well, so, There's yeah. We have, to, we have to wrap it up, I'm sorry. Uh, what, one last? All right. Tom, it's Maverick. Can I shake your hand, please? Hey, Maverick, sure. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you so much for Wonderful. being here tonight. I'll be out there signing books. Thank you all.
Thank you all so much for thank you all so much for coming. Ta -ta -ta -ta. There you go. So if you'd like to get your book signed, uh, you can form a line on the wall over there, the north wall of the room.